rather than um, <clears throat> speak a whole sermon this morning, we're going to k- keep it short. Uh, but I do want to look at this passage that we're up to in Romans 8 today from 18 to 30 because I believe it's incredibly, incredibly timely just as how God has worked and uh, brought things about. And so let's have a read of this together. Romans 8, 18 to 30. If you have your Bible open, that follow along on your phone, however, or we've got it on the screen. Amazing. It says this. It says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters, and that and those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Beautiful, beautiful words. And so just a few reflections for us to look at very briefly. And I'm going to steal Jess's three Ps that she shared with us at, um, at the board meeting. And she may have stolen them from Rick Warren or Warren Wearsby or one of these people who love to preach the P words in, in, in order to lay it out. And so the first thing we see is about a perspective shift. It's about realigning our perspective, renewing our perspective in the midst of trials. In 8, 18 to 19 we have this reminder that our present sufferings, though they might be many and varied depending on who we are, where we've come from, and that no one is immune, but it continues on with these wonderful words of hope, of expectation and anticipation, that that is not all that there is. It's not all that there is. Despite the sufferings that we experience and the way in which the world groans with us, longing to be renewed, we do not need to be pessimistic about our future because we have hope for future glory, hope both in the present and most definitely in in eternity, both because we look forward to the resurrection of our body and we look forward to a new heaven and a new earth as all creation looks forward to and groans for that, where all that God has promised will come to pass with God's new order in a new heaven and a new earth where where there will be no more sin, no more sickness, no more disease and evil that is so prevalent, where ultimately all will be as it should be. And so rather than focusing in and only seeing present suffering, present discouragement, present trial, we are encouraged to shift our perspective to the long game, to that which truly lasts. As Paul says in verse 18, he says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. 
And so he's saying that this future glory that awaits is so, so great, so incomparable and incomprehensible even, that the present sufferings are insignificant by comparison. That, it, that is being produced both in us as he purposes in us to make us like Christ and the long-term glory that it lies ahead. That is forever, whereas the suffering that we experience here and now is temporary. In 2 Corinthians 4.17, Paul basically says the same thing. He says, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. And so what do we do in light of that? Well, he continues, he says, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is, because that is what is seen, it says is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. And so we shift our perspective. It's number one, perspective. Secondly, and as we and all creation look forward to and groan for that which is to come, God in the midst of it all gives us his presence. Right, the presence of the Holy Spirit. He says, "Lo, I will be with you always, even to the end of this, the end of the age." And so, as we continue on, firstly, He gives us a new perspective, and then reminds us of His presence with us, that we have not been left alone. He will never. This is where Romans eight goes. Where he will never leave us, never forsake us. And so these verses point out that believers are not left to our own resources in our sufferings. Notice how it says the Spirit helps in verses 26 to 27. It says in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And so he helps us in the presence. There's this beautiful picture, I reckon, because it's of the Spirit stepping in and helping us, carrying our load, interceding with us and for us, with groans for us when we don't even know what to pray, we don't even know what to say. And so this passage gives us amazing, amazing assurance that when we are confused or broken because we don't understand what's happening in or around us, God sends the spirit of his son into our hearts who is present and intercedes for us so that when we don't even know what to pray, he prays with groans that can't even be expressed in words. And so while we might feel ignorant or helpless or lost, the Spirit does not. Isn't that amazingly reassuring? The Spirit does not. Philip Yancey has said it like this. He says, though we feel exhausted and confused, confused the Spirit doesn't. God is not far off that we need to raise out our voices to be heard. Instead, we need only groan. We need only groan. And so in the midst of suffering, firstly, we're given this new perspective, right? Rem that, that of the long game. We're reminded of his presence with us, his intercession for us, and that finally... He works all things according to his purpose, his plan, his glory. Paul concludes with those verses that, that, that are probably familiar to so many of us. In verses 28 to 29, he says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined, to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Mm -hmm. 
So what this means is that God works in everything. Absolutely everything. Not just isolated incidents, not just the the bad or the good or the, the things that he might be able to do something with, but he works in everything, all of it, at all times. Jesus says, my father is always working. And he does that for our good. This doesn't mean that everything that happens to us is good because evil is prevalent in this fallen world. But what it is saying is that God in his goodness, in his power, in his almighty authority, in his providence, will turn every circumstance around for the good of those who love him and that God is going to fulfill his purpose in us, in and through the midst of it which is to make us like Christ, to continually conform us deeper to his image, to, to, to cause us to increasingly look more and more and more like Jesus, to push us deeper into him. And so in all the circumstances and the seasons of life, the ups and the downs, because we have this eternal perspective and the presence of the Spirit with us, in all the seasons, who helps us in our weaknesses with groans that can't even be uttered, we can still be filled with hope. Because we have overwhelming assurance that God is at work. He's not taken by surprise. He's fulfilling his purpose and he is shaping all of us to be increasingly good reflections of him. And so we keep looking to and trusting in him. Looking to the things that are unseen rather than just the stuff that's temporary. Pressing deeper into Jesus who is not unfamiliar with suffering himself but able to empathise with us in our weaknesses who is present and who is at work in all of it. And so let's pray as a band comes Lord God life is just messy but we praise you that you renew our perspective and so continue to give us a perspective of your presence of the long term of the things that are eternal of the things that you might be doing in and through us. We thank you for the Spirit of God that is present with us, who carries us, carries our load and groans in ways when we don't even know what to pray or say. We thank you ultimately, God, that you will fulfill your purpose. What an insane amount of hope and joy and anticipation we have because you are always at work. And the messier the stuff, the greater the glory you receive as you use it for your purpose. Lord, would your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen.